The magical mountain Slievenamon faces across the valley of the shore towards the Comra Hills. The tidal waters of the river separate the counties Waterford and Tipperary. Just above this point lies the town of Carrick, thought to have been a Viking trading post 700 years ago. A member of the Butler family, Black Tom, the 10th Earl of Ormond, built the beautiful Elizabethan manor house. The shore was then the main highway for military and commercial traffic from the seaport of Waterford. It's hard to imagine that the present town grew from a small settlement on a swampy island in the river. In Chapel Street, a hen's race from the church, the brisk activity of the Shanahan brothers, Michael and Joseph, the basket weavers, doesn't fit the popular view held in neighboring towns of sleepy Carrick where nothing moves but the fighting Carrick dogs. The two Shanahans are the last practitioners of a craft handed down to them over three generations. <coughs> Edward Carey lives far away from Tipperary on the Meath-Louth border in Drumgill, Drumconrath. In February each year, he harvests the sallies, cutting quickly and neatly close to the crown to avoid disease, and also in order that branching will not occur in next year's crop. There are plenty of sallies growing in his garden which are more suitable for modern purposes than those decorating the banks of the shore because of care and attention. The stools of the willows growing on his land are more than 100 years old. The average yield under good conditions is 10 tons per annum for one statute acre. A pretty incredible return. The almost casual way that Eddie secures the bundles with a single sally rod and tamps them is deceptive. They are very securely tied because of their willfulness and because there's a long journey ahead of them by road to Carrick and Shore. Many months will pass before we see them again. In April, Michael Shanahan strips the bark from the green willow using a brake. This work used to be carried out by women, and their children also earned pocket money after school by helping their mothers. The payment was by the bundle of rods stripped. The soft bark of the green willow is broken on two sides by contact with the iron rods. Having divided the end of the rod into three with a knife, the fender three is brought into action. This implement is inserted into the rods at one end and the willow is split three ways. This is carried out on the willows which are too strong and large to weave easily by hand. The rods are adaptable and durable. Willows were used in ancient times as shields in war. They were planted on river banks to prevent erosion. 
Their wood has always been used for cricket bats and in the last century for the paddles of steamers. It also has a medicinal value. The contraption on which Joe is now sitting has been unchanged since about 1500. The basket weavers in Ireland call it a cooper's mare, while brewers call it a cooper's horse. And elsewhere, it's known as a shaving horse. In all cases, however, it's foot operated, leaving the hands free to hold the willow rods, which rest on a leather pad to prevent slipping. Joe shaves off the center of the willow rod until it is flat with a sharp draw knife. The wooden coiler bends and shapes the rods into circular hoops without splitting them. At one time, the Shadowhand supplied thousands of willow hoops to the local coopers who made wooden barrels to carry dry goods such as butter and nails. Unfortunately, it's uneconomic today to harvest the local sallies, or silver sticks as they're called, which grow along the banks of the shore. Apart from the native unstripped rods that Eddie Carey supplies, the rest come from Taunton in Somerset. The buff willows on the left have been boiled with the bark still on them, before stripping so that the tannin may give them a nice stain. The center ones are unstripped native rods and the white ones have had the bark removed without boiling. At a conservative estimate there are at least 60 varieties of willow. Most of the green willows grown in Ireland and along the banks of the shore are Salex viminalis whereas the imported willows are probably Salex triandra have to be left steeping in water for several hours to make them pliable for weaving so that they can be bent without snapping. Michael Shanahan is starting to make a traditional eel trap, a type which has been used for centuries on the river shore. These are native unstripped willow rods. The wooden base of the template will hold the rod steady until the basket can support itself. These rods will form the inside neck of the eel trap. In a Danish museum, there's a Stone Age version of an eel trap found near Jutland. The eel was a popular food in medieval times also. The taste is a bit like lamb's liver, which has been lightly fried, but there's a slight saltiness to the flavor, which relieves it of oiliness. Eels were on sale in Carrick and Clonmel on Thursdays because the people didn't regard them as being fish. When the dietary laws of the Roman Catholic Church were more rigid, it was thought wise not to eat eel on a Friday in case it might be meat. Michael is weaving the neck of the trap with a stroke known in the trade as slewing. The term means that an odd number of rods are employed on the side of the basket. How many depends on the nature of the basket and the choice of the weaver. In order to make the basket very secure, Michael tightens the weave by beating the slats with a hand iron. Strong willow rods are needed for the base of the herring crown that Joe Shanahan is starting to make. His hands and spatulate fingers are immensely powerful from a lifetime of weaving.
The crown is the only fish basket regarded as an official measure since the crown weight was decided in 1889. This is perhaps the last crown that Joe will make, as new EEC regulations have made the measure obsolete, and the modern containers are of plastic. Michael, meanwhile, is progressing with the eel trap. He's bending or kinking the rods at the turning point at the neck of the trap. The base of the herring crown is reinforced by introducing extra willow rods to prevent the bottom from sagging when full. natural sally rods of the eel trap have a very pleasant smell, not unlike honey. Joe and Michael's grandfather, John Shanahan, was a native of Newtown, Kilmacthomas County, Waterford. He came to Carrigan Shore in 1888, where he was apprenticed to a local basket maker before setting up on his own. He made potato baskets in several sizes and shapes, which he and his wife Mary brought to the local fairs at Clonmel. Kilkenny and Waterford by horse and cart. He also made skioks, a tray-like basket with a handle for the brogue makers who lived and worked in Crook Lane Carrick to carry their strong boots to the fairs. John and Mary had five children, four boys and one girl. All the boys joined their father at the basket making, which was at a high point during the First World War. John won a lucrative contract from the then British Railways making hampers for carrying live fowl. The piece of wood being inserted into the weave will carry the official capacity stamp and is obligatory by law. Michael uses the point of a knife to make holes in the center of the rods so that they will bend without splitting. The edges of the basket are turned down or whaled. After the establishment of the Free State in 1922, times were very difficult for the basket makers of Carrick and Shore. Because of free trade, cheap imported baskets flooded into the country. The Shanahans turned to making cane furniture and baskets for transporting yeast from brewer to baker. Later, tariffs were introduced on imported goods which helped to ease the situation. The Second World War created a huge demand for the Shanahan's baskets, as cardboard containers were unobtainable. They had 20 men in employment, seven or eight permanently in the sally yard by the river, who worked with the help of women, sorting, grading, and stripping the willows. There were also 12 cutters on the river harvesting willows. This was seasonal work from November to March. The Shanahan's had 38 Irish acres of sallies below Carrick, which stretched upstream from the old toll bridge at Fidan. The men cut the willows and stacked the bundles on the bank when the tide was out. Later, at high tide, the bundles were collected and transferred to a barge, which was poled up the river to the Sally Yard. The basket maker generally sits with his back to the wall, his basket on an oblong section of timber which can be raised or lowered to a comfortable working height with a block of wood. 
The lid of the eel trap is of willow, although occasionally, in Yarmouth, England, they're made of wood. Extra care is taken to fit the lid tightly. The sally rod is twisted in such a way that it won't break. A botkin opens up the weave of the basket. When in use, the trap will have a rope tied round its wasted top, secured to a float or the back. It will be baited with old fish remains or offal, and set so that the opening always faces downstream. The trap is an excellent example of a well-designed object, functional, neat, and with a very good shape. Palambang cane is used for the handles of the herring cran. Crans are usually stacked full of fish, one on top of the other in groups of three. They are then lifted by the purchaser altogether, it being unnecessary to weigh them. Fergus Pyre, who is apprentice to the Shanahans, hopes to be a vocational teacher and will pass on the skills which he has learned. He's using a picking knife to finish off the eel trap. Tom Tobin, who used to work for the Shanahans, returns to make a traditional yeast basket. Oh, not at all, Joe. You couldn't forget this job. It's like uh, riding a bicycle. You'll never forget it. I'm a long time away from this, but uh, you'll never lose, lose the technique. <coughs> Here we go again. 
Now we put in the edge stakes, which you always see. I'm going to show you how to make a yeast basket now. You must have made a lot of yeast baskets, Tom, in your day. Uh, thousands of by beyond beyond count. About what seven hundred a week was made in the in the factory when we were at them. Now you turn up the stakes like this, see? After leaving school, I got a job. A messenger boy in a shop, three and sixpence a week. So I got into the yeast basket factory then, and I still was at it for years and years and years. Until the, the paper mills started to make a cut and cheaper, they done away with this. I can't get it, you want? They pick. They made, uh, these are 16 square, these baskets. Where did they get their materials from? An inexhaustible supply of material was down there on that river of uh, Sally's for basket making. There must have been quite a number working about the courting of the, of the Sally's. Oh, well, there was. Bringing them up. It was meant to unload the boats when they come up. There was women then to sort out the stuff into different sizes. Battle, half battle, firkin. What used to do in the evening, Tom, when you'd be finished? Well, I usually go to the pictures. That's all we had to do. There was nothing else in Carrick. At that time, we made the picture house down to Pappy McGrath, fourpences, fourpence a time, stand on the sawdust on the floor for fourpence. You pay a sixpence and you can go up in the seas at an ordinary forum. And the sheets across the room tied at four corners. That was the cinema screen. See, if Fill in the sides like that with a, a fistful of stuff every time. Another point you want to watch is to keep the thing straight to size. Now we're nearly nine inches high now. Well, were all the Sally's uh, homegrown? They no imported. They were, they were no imported Sally's, but of course there was imported cane. You had to import the cane, you know. <coughs> For, uh, they used to make, we used to make a lot of hampers, travellers' hampers and railway hampers at the time. You were kept very busy with that. What do you only do is just the ones? The yeast basket. Oh, never used again. It was scrapped. Sure. Yeah. That was why there was such a demand for them. They could use them the second time, they'd be all right. How much would you pay for these baskets, Tom? We were paid per dozen, not a weekly wage at all. It was up to yourself telling what you could. And if you couldn't, I help you. Well, there's problems here, me what now. Hang that up in the wall now and you'll be saying, oh God, poor old Tom. The modern craze of hot air ballooning has given the Shanahans, who are reliable craftsmen, a new lease of life. The speed with which they have adapted from one aspect of weaving to another is remarkable. This basket, except for its wooden base, is made entirely of Palembang cane. Palembang was one of the most important trading posts in China. It was an independent kingdom near Sumatra and stands at the mouth of the Musi River. The cane is glossy, strong and flexible. Human beings rather than herrings will be the cargo. Everything must be firmly secured in place with the greatest care, especially as balloon baskets are crossing the Atlantic these days and will have all sorts of weather vagaries to contend with. As did the commercial travellers arriving in Carrick in the old days by rail. Their samples or wares were carried in skips or hampers generally rented from the railway company. On arrival, they hired the local Jarvis to transport them and their goods around the town from merchant to merchant before leaving by train in the evening for a new destination. The stainless steel rim which surrounds the basket will support the gas burner held in position by steel cables which will direct hot air into the canopy of the balloon. How many hundreds, perhaps thousands of miles, will the Shanahan's basket 
drift across the surface of the Earth. The Shanahan brothers have their feet firmly on the ground and can smoke their pipes in Carrick with the secure knowledge of all good craftsmen that they have done something well.